Welcome all. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar uh, hosted by Jad Bio in partnership with Potato News Today, uh, a website dedicated to uh, the uh, cultivation of potatoes and everything related to potatoes. So today's webinar is how to employ uh, automated machine learning in order to predict the best quality potato chip or crisp. And uh, I think that is um, an important uh, point um, to discuss. So let us uh, start with some uh, logistics and give me a second here so we can start our presentation going. So uh, before I start presenting um, our JetBio uh, members for today's presentation, uh, let me also thank uh, Luki Peterze for um, helping us arrange this webinar and um, for all that he does um, for all uh, those interested in uh, the potato world. So uh, myself, uh, my name is Aris Karanikas and apologies for the hard Greek name. And I am the chief business officer here at JetBio. And I will be uh, giving you the first part of the presentation, kind of setting up the context uh, and then uh, my colleague, Dr. Vincenzo Lagani, will be taking over uh, to actually uh, work uh, hands-on with the tool uh, in order to show uh, a couple of use cases of how exactly uh, you can predict the quality um, of a potato uh, crisp. So, um, of course, we would be using the JetBio application uh, in order to do that. So, uh, let me start. Uh, with this uh, quote that uh, I came across while perusing uh, Potato News today. And I think it has an important message. To save the world, start with fixing how we grow potatoes. And uh, I, thought, I know this goes all uh, into regenerative uh, cultivation and uh, what we need to do in order to have uh, sustainable um, agriculture. Uh, but uh, I want us to look uh, at this question from the viewpoint of machine learning. And here the question becomes, how can AI and machine learning help improve the odds of producing a potato that will yield what we all want, a good uh, quality, a perfect chip, as we say. So the question becomes, can we complement the work of agronomists in order to ensure a best performing crop? And here, let me uh, segue for a second and uh, just say a few things. Um, obviously, you don't want to burden you with uh, technical terms and uh, uh, details, but um, just to, to set the general context, AI, what is AI? Well, in essence, AI and machine learning um, are statistical models, right? That allow us to identify patterns and uh, use these patterns to uh, predict um, to, well, after we've analyzed the data, uh, we've identified the patterns and relationships that will allow us uh, to predict future behavior. So um, let's move to uh, the next level, let's say, of, of machine learning, uh, which is automated machine learning. So why did automated machine learning come about? Because uh, of course there are challenges to machine learning and not everyone can do it. So automated machine learning has addressed a lot of the challenges uh, that come with uh, how can I combine a number of different algorithms uh, into my pipeline in order to get the desired outcome. So by employing an auto ML solution, what in essence you're doing, of course, as the word denotes automating that process, what you're doing is you're taking away a lot of these challenges. So really what you need to do is, you know, have your input and your data set and uh, present all your configurations constraints. And then the system takes over and extracts the features that it needs in order um, to do the prediction and then select the appropriate algorithms, tune the hyperparameters uh, in order to create that model, which we need in order uh, to predict the future. So uh, JADBio is exactly that. JADBio is a purpose-built 
AutoML platform for life science professionals. Uh, and it allows you to build and deploy accurate and explainable predictive models with great speed and ease. And the most important part is it works with all kinds of life science data. So human, animal, and plant data, okay? So um, let me just mention in passing some of the applications that uh, JetBio can have uh, starting from, uh, from the human world, uh, where it, uh, it allows us to predict models, um, actually to create predictive models to uh, diagnose uh, and provide treatment, uh, looking at how compounds can help uh, specific diseases. More importantly, identifying these predictors uh, that allow us to create diagnostic ass uh, assays uh, in order to, uh, for example, understand if someone has uh, a specific disease or a type of disease, uh, subtype of disease, and how we can cure it. Uh, I want to spend a bit more time on agriculture today uh, and the things that we can do here and think of in the context of precision agriculture, uh, what we can do in order to uh, not only predict uh, how a very, a various factors in agriculture um, influence the result, and by result, of course, I mean the yield, um, but uh, uh, also uh, using these predictions in order to influence uh, the outcome. So looking, for example, at what kind of genes um, produce a specific trait, which is desirable or undesirable, and then uh, by that make our appropriate decision. Uh, or um, for example, in, uh, when we talk about greenhouses, uh, how do we manage the whole process? How do we uh, look at things like temperature, uh, evaporation, soil, everything uh, in order to produce the optimal result? And of course, in general, uh, looking at crop management and the quality of that management, uh, sorry, the quality of that crop and we'll be speaking more about that uh, later on. Uh, looking now at a subsection, I guess, of, of agriculture, livestock management, by the same token, we can look at, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, you know, how, um, how a uh, livestock that we have is going to grow, um, you know, between now and, and slaughter day. Uh, or um, you know any diseases that we might be uh, afraid of um, that would be caught by uh, by the livestock that we have, uh, and in general, looking at machine learning driven farms where again we manage all the uh, the factors that influence uh, the desired outcome and how we can of course uh, in turn influence the result. So uh, looking again into agriculture and um, giving you a few uh, hands-on examples, uh, starting with uh, what we are going to be speaking more today, which is predicting the chip quality from metabolites measured in the potato tubers. So uh, that goes under the general etiquette of crop quality prediction. Uh, we can, of course, uh, work on yield prediction, and an example of that is predicting uh, coffee yield using soil fertility. Uh, of course, disease detection, as we discussed, um, so thrip uh, infestation in strawberries, uh, and in general, looking at the supply chain sustainability in agriculture, predicting the level of CO2 emissions um, from weather, soil, and cultivation information. So that gives you a sense of the kinds of things um, that we can do using machine learning in agriculture. Um, and as you can see here, there are a million more uh, applications that you can uh, look up at uh, on Google Scholar um, for agriculture and machine learning. So um, I've said a few things about the applications that we can cover with uh, JetBio AutoML. Uh, let me just take a very quick second to uh, discuss a few of uh, JetBio, uh, let's say, uh, outstanding characteristics and benefits. 
So as I said in the beginning, it's fully automated. So you don't need to be able to code in order to use what we do. You just need to be able to produce an Excel sheet or any uh, comma separated um, CSV file uh, or delimited in any other form that you want um, so that we can, um, we can analyze it. Um, the only things we will ask for are questions about what you want to do, not technical questions regarding to the machine learning part of things. Now, the other important part is that we can handle large feature sets. And when we mean large feature sets, uh, we're talking about hundreds of thousands to million to millions uh, of features. Uh, and that can include, of course, genetic information as you know, the reading of, of genomes is, is progressing, uh, more and more features um, are available. So that gives us a wealth of information to work with. Now, another problem that life sciences, uh, scientists usually have uh, is that they don't have uh, enough samples. They may have a lot of measurements, but not enough samples. So uh, the beauty of this solution is that it can also work with a very limited sample size um, and um, you know, working between 10 to 15 per class. Uh, so if you have uh, you know, a couple of classes or more, uh, if you have something like 10 to 15 samples per class, we're able to work with it. Um, also uh, uh, an important, um, attribute to the system is the ability to work with sensor data uh, and uh, produce what we call a survival analysis. So let's say that you're looking at predicting when um, you know, your livestock or your plants are going to be infected with a disease, uh, but you don't know exactly when this is happening because uh, the data that you have, some of the plants have gotten the disease, some have not. So you can work with that data to predict and uh, classify the risk of the rest of the uh, population getting that disease. And most importantly, working with, um, with new samples, you know, new um, crops uh, in order to predict um, exactly that risk um, of happening. Um, and the last thing uh, I wanted to point out that there is a, um, an API that you can work with if uh, you're so inclined. Uh, and that also can cover uh, images of any sort um, that you might have. Uh, for example, if you have images of three uh, infestation, you know, you can uh, work with those and uh, we can analyze them. So uh, just to finish off, let's say my, my sales pitch on, on the tool, um, we like to say that um, with JetBio, you can get ease and value at scale. So it's very easy to operate. It produces excellent quality results and uh, you can work with multiples of analyses, uh, multiples of problems and finding solutions to them very quickly uh, and very easily. Now, uh, I'm going to briefly, before I pass it on to Dr. Lagani, I'm going to just quickly set up um, the discussion uh, for uh, what he will be showing you on the tool um, for the case study that we have for you today. So uh, what you'll be, you will be seeing uh, today is based on this publication um, that, as you can see here, was uh, made in 2010. And um, this uh, historical information um, was um, the objective, let's say, of that research was to predict the quality of, um, of the potato on the basis of uh, metabolites, uh, profiles, and the other, uh, let's say, factors of, of cultivation, like soil, like weather, um, and so on. Uh, so the, the predictors were uh, collected um, during harv uh, harvesting or even before that, while the quality assessment of uh, the resulting potatoes was made about a month um, after the harvesting. So uh, a few more details uh, on the study itself. Uh, one second while I move the slide here. Um, 
So the uh, the growing of uh, those 20 different cultivars uh, was made in Germany. And as you can see here, it was made over two years in 2006 and 2007. And in two different uh, soil types in Böllendorf and Ebstorf, um, that gives me a chance to use my German here, uh, where you have loamy soil on one hand and sandy soil on the other. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, we're talking about 20 different cultivars that were used um, in this uh, study. So uh, once uh, these were harvested, uh, they were uh, put through a spectrometer uh, in order to uh, identify, uh, I think about 203 metabolites uh, Vincenzo would, uh, would help me with that once he, once he takes over. And once they did all that, uh, the next step uh, was to uh, identify uh, two things. Uh, one is those potatoes that were uh, susceptible or not susceptible to bruising. Uh, the way they did that is after uh, centrifuging uh, the potatoes, they identified uh, and measured uh, the number of bruises and um, the size of the black spots, let's say. And uh, on the other hand, in order to identify the quality of, uh, of the chip, they did that against the European standard. Uh, and we're famous in Europe for European stand uh, for standards, uh, uh, the color scale for fried potatoes. Okay, so all this work uh, was uh, culminated in the creation of this here uh, Excel sheet. Um, and uh, as you can see, it provides uh, all the information we need, uh, the number of samples, uh, what cultivar they belong to, uh, the soil type, whether, um, whether they were rep uh, replicates, uh, and all this information, and of course, the 203 metabolites. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Lagani will go into more detail uh, as to this. I just want to uh, obviously re reiterate that the objectives here were twofold. One was to identify the predictors that can give us this um, outcome, and of course, produce the model that would allow us to predict um, the same um, train the model, let's say, that would allow us to predict uh, the future behavior of um, other uh, potatoes grown. So by that, uh, I'm going to pass the ball over to Dr. Lagani and um, uh, see uh, how this uh, works in action using uh, JetBio. Perfect. Thanks, Alice, for the very nice uh, introduction. So uh, I guess you should be able to see my screen by now. So in this moment, uh, what you are looking for, this is uh, actually the uh, interface of our application, of our web application, Jadbio. This is our uh, dashboard. Here you have all the information needed in order to manage your data and your analysis. The whole application pretty much is pretty much a plat, pretty much project based, meaning that all the data are organized in a series of projects. For example, for today's use case, we have a project here about potato quality. Actually, I have already uploaded all the data for the uh, webinar here, and also I perform all the analysis. But of course, uh, we are going to go through one of these uh, analysis in order to see how the system works. So of course, for a tool called Just Add Data Bio, the first action that you have uh, to perform is actually to uh, load the data. So this means that uh, with this button here, we can start uh, loading the data that uh, uh, Aris. So the system asked me to uh, choose a file. So I will just choose a file that is uh, inside my uh, 
my computer here. These are nothing else than uh, the uh, data that uh, are sold. And uh, in particular, this one has been prepared. This is a comma separate file that has been prepared, prepared for predicting whether uh, the potatoes are susceptible to black spot bruising. Once I choose the file, this, uh, can, uh, this is uh, uh, uploaded. And uh, I can specify whether feature names and sample names are already in my file, as is the, this is the case. And uh, I already get here uh, a preview of my data. So these are, again, exactly the data that I saw. We have uh, one row for its uh, potato, potato tuber. And for each one of these potato tuber, I have information about which soil was cultivated in, how was the weather when it was cultivated, uh, whether it is or not susceptible to black spot bruising, this is what we want to predict, and plus, of course, uh, all the information about the metabolomic profile. Since everything seems to be okay, I can give a name to this uh, data set. This name is already taken, I will just add a two because I already uploaded the same data set before. And now we just by you will try to uh, have a guess on the what type of data I have uploaded here. Uh, regarding the metabolomics data, uh, these are numbers. These are just the concentration. So here I have the name of the metabolite. And here I have the relative concentration of this metabolite across different tubers. Here I have uh, uh, some categoric information because uh, whether the uh, potatoes was uh, uh, grown in a loamy or sandy uh, uh, field. This is uh, a category, of course, loamy or sandy. And also have information about the cultivar. Uh, this was taken as numeric, unfortunately, because uh, the data as provided by the researchers uh, were actually uh, actually encoded the, the cultivar as numbers, but we know that these are categories. Of, I mean, there are just uh, 20 types of uh, potatoes in this data set, so we will have it as, category, as categorical. Once uh, this is done, the data are basically inside the system now. And uh, here we are. This is the data set we just uh, uh, load in the system. And now, actually, the real work, uh, the interesting part, uh, actually starts. So the key point now is uh, we do want uh, to predict on the basis uh, of the information in this, uh, uh, in this data set the susceptibility to black spot bruising for different potatoes. In order to do that, I will start an analysis. It's just a matter of clicking on the perform analysis here. And once I do that, the value will ask me some, some very few questions. The first question, of course, is uh, what I want to predict. So I will indicate the black spot bruising. And from this moment on, all of the information are candidate predictors. So they may enter in the final model for predicting this particular outcome. And uh, instead, this column will be the outcome to be predicted. In the next panel, what uh, I see are some more questions that Bayo asked me in order to understand how I desire this, I desire this analysis to be uh, executed. So there are no technical questions here. Uh, the key point is that uh, the user must express uh, what they desire, and then the system automatically will understand how to best perform the analysis in order to accommodate both the characteristic of the data and the preference of the user. So in this case, for example, I will indicate that uh, I want to reduce as much as possible the number of predictors. So I want uh, a predictive model that uses very few predictors in order to be applicable in the practice, uh, in case you want to create uh, some type of fit in order to assess the quality of the potato on the field. Then I can decide how much uh, time I can actually give the by in order to uh, execute this analysis. So I can uh, ask for a preliminary analysis that will take relatively little time and will actually, uh, in a sense, will explore relatively few models. Or I can go to TPO extensive. And so increasing the time I give to Zaba in order to execute the analysis, but also having more models explored. Just to give an idea for such a data set, uh, 400 samples and 210 predictors, preliminary takes a few seconds, extensive can take up, up to one hour. We keep it to preliminary since we want to have an example just here. 
I'll also indicate the number of CPUs. And uh, finally, I will also indicate that we have some replicates in our data set. This is in order to have an unbiased analysis. It seems uh, replicates are pretty much uh, in pretty much important concept in statistical analysis. And it's also a pretty much unique characteristics of Project Bio. So having done that, all that I have to do is just to run the analysis. In the moment when I run the analysis, a new analysis is created here in this panel, and it's already running. So what is happening in the background is that JALBIO already decide uh, what type of analysis must be performed, meaning what type of models must be tried. And the analysis already started here. I can act uh, follow uh, how the progress for the analysis uh, through this panel. Uh, here I can see that uh, uh, basically around 3,400 models should be trained and already 220 or have been trained. So in a few more seconds, uh, I will actually see here that, uh, okay, the analysis was performed. So this is how it went. I mean, uh, across all the models trained, the uh, predictive performance was uh, pretty much high and constant. At the end, 340 models were uh, explored and uh, the system automatically understood that uh, 3,000 more models were not even uh, worth the time to, uh, to try them because the solution we already got, uh, it's the optimal one. So now the analysis finished, I can, I can close this panel here and we can actually see uh, what are the results of the analysis. So Zadbio actually presents uh, a, quite, quite a number of results for the per user of the interest researcher. In this case, uh, what we want to answer are the questions that uh, actually Aris asked at the, at the end uh, at the end of his uh, of his talk, basically want to know what are the predictors out of the 208 ones that uh, actually are necessary in order to predict the quality. So we can see this uh, in this uh, panel here, and basically we can see that uh, in order to predict the susceptibility to black spot bruising, what we actually need are only seven pieces of information. The first one is the cultivar, and then I have six more metabolites that uh, I should measure in order to perform this prediction. I also see that uh, uh, in terms of feature importance, the cultivar is uh, pretty much the most relevant one, and the metabolites uh, basically, they kind of uh, complement the predictive power of the cultivar. The second question that uh, actually Aris asked is uh, actually uh, uh, what is the model that can predict the quality of the potatoes on the basis of uh, this information we have here. The model has been created it's inside the bio. In this case, it's a, um, it's a linear model. Uh, basically, we can also see this model in this case because it's an interpretable model. And uh, for this type of linear model, we have uh, coefficients that refer to every single one of the predictors that has been selected. And basically, in order to predict the quality of a new harvest of potatoes, all that I would need to do would be just to use this coefficient in, co in combination with the predictors in order to make these predictions. Of course, I don't have to do this manually. Actually, Jalba, you can, uh, can do this for us. And uh, this means to apply the model. So when I go to the apply the model, now I will apply this model on a set of uh, potatoes that have not been used during the training. This means that actually I have a total independent validation set. And this mimic what will happen if you first train a model or some historical data, and then want, you want to apply it on a new harvest to see what, what is the quality of these new potatoes you collected. So I will choose the model here to apply. I will just choose the data. So uh, I will indicate that I want to use some independent validation data set. And uh, this data set here, second, sorry. This data set here is the test data set that has not been used in the training. 
So I will now apply the model on this new data set. The application of the model is extremely fast. It's just, it's just pretty much simple computations. And what uh, this gives us is first and foremost, uh, the predictions. So this means that I can download the prediction that has been provided for new, uh, new potatoes. And here I can see, for example, or oh, these are all, each row corresponds to a new potato for which I want to know the uh, quality. This is a test data set. So actually I also know the actual label. And here I can see, for example, that uh, that bio for this uh, sample number 12, it predicted with a probability of 67% uh, that this will be not susceptible. And indeed, uh, this is not susceptible. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, we we can't actually see your. Uh, oh, my apologies. My apologies because uh, I didn't share my whole screen. Uh, so this is a file with predictions. No, thank you, Aris. I mean, I, I, I didn't think about that. So this is about the predictions. And again, each row, it's a new prediction. And basically we have, for example, this sample that that bio predicted uh, to be uh, not susceptible to black, to black spot bruising with a 67% probability. And indeed it's not susceptible. And the other way around for this other sample, we have a 94% probability that is susceptible to black, black spot bruising and indeed is susceptible. So with this probability, you can actually rank your new potatoes from the most susceptible to the least susceptible and act accordingly. Uh, so let me share again. So how accurate is this rank in our case? This is measured by the AUC, the area under the curve. Basically, on this new test set is 91%. Uh, this means that 91% of the potato pairs are ranked correctly. And this is on the, on the validation set. And what is most important is that uh, on solely on the training set, we were able uh, to predict that, uh, actually to estimate that uh, our best model on an independent test set will have had a, um, will have had a um, will have, have had a predictive performance close to 90% AUC. And indeed, this is exactly what we got. So this is for the black spot uh, bruising. Uh, there are many more information to be explored, but uh, I want to go towards a different analysis. Uh, we also performed the same analysis for the chip quality, basically uh, how the potatoes will look like one and feel like once fried. This has to also do with the Maillard reaction. So the data sets are already here. And uh, yeah, again, it's exactly the same data set as we saw before, just that uh, instead of uh, predicting the black spot bruising susceptibility, we can predict the chip quality, low or high. This analysis has been already performed, so I can just go to the analysis tab and show you the analysis. And also in this case, what we see is that very few features are needed in order to uh, predict this outcome. Basically, we only need in this case three features, three predictors in order to predict the, uh, the chip quality. One is the color. Here we can see that uh, most of the cultivars tend to give a low quality chip, while there are a few of them that give a much higher quality chip. Then we have also the soil, with the loamy soil on average getting a tiny, uh, more sense, uh, higher chance of getting high quality chips. And finally, there's also this uh, metabolite, that the higher concentration of this metabolite, the lower probability of getting high quality chips. Again, we can also see the physical importance. And again, the cultivar is the most important one. And uh, also in this case, for this analysis, uh, we do have saved the best model inside that bio. And we can also apply this model. And this time, I want to apply this model on some, uh, on just one uh, new potato, let's say. So what I can do is actually to manually enter the, um, to manually enter the values for which I want prediction. 
So I can say that uh, this new potato will be of cultivar number 12, for example. The concentration here will be 0 0.02. Uh, and the soil will be loamy. And for this specific potato, here we have that the results will be uh, pretty much for sure a low quality potato, unfortunately. So uh, I still have a couple of minutes. I was I want to just to mention that uh, we have, since we got that the cultivar is the most important uh, factor here. We also ask ourselves uh, what happens when uh, the cultivar is not available because uh, these analyses are only valid, let's say, for the 20 cultivars that are in um, that are included in the data set. But uh, of course, there are thousands of other cultivars that are potato cultivars that are available. So we repeated the same analysis, but this time by excluding the cultivar as a predictor. And what we found out is actually that. Uh, it's still possible to predict the quality of the uh, potato, even without information about the, uh, the cultivar. However, you will need more information from the metabolic, metabolics, uh, from the meta, meta, metabolic profile. So in this case, for black spot bruising, you will need something like 23, uh, the concentration of 23 different metabolites and the uh, AUC that you can uh, achieve in this case is around 80-89%. Uh, and instead for the chip quality, what you obtain if you exclude the uh, cultivar gain will be a model that requires uh, again uh, a larger number of uh, meta metabolites. Actually, will require the information about the soil and the information about 24 more metabolites. So basically, once you remove the cultivar from the question, you need the many more information in order to uh, make up for it. And again, also here, you are going to, uh, you should get a uh, performance that is uh, quite high, even if you don't have information about the cultivar. It is again 80, around 89%. So I'm um, uh, done with the uh, use case here and uh, I will be glad to uh, to have Aris uh, ending our discussion here. Yeah um, so uh, before before we go to the next uh, the closing section of, of the presentation, um, we do have uh, a couple of questions. Um, so let me let me start on those in the order that they were presented. Um, so from from Imam, uh, if this is uh, automatic, uh, how can the machine ensure the information provided is certain? Um, so I don't know um, if you if you want to take a go uh, at it, uh, Vincenzo. Um, I can ahead. I can go for it. So the automatic. in this case uh, refers to the fact that uh, the system is able to automatically analyze the data and uh, plan all the analysis. Uh, regarding instead whether the information is sure, uh, this is uh, basically a, a, a something that comes before. So our system is called just, uh, just add data. This means that uh, uh, the data must be provided and uh, out of the data that are provided, we ensure that uh, we automatically select uh, the best uh, analysis plan. Yeah, um, that, that was uh, actually going to be my response as well. So I'm happy to see where the line. Um, there is also another question as to how JetBio compares to other AutoML tools. Um, I, I would love to speak forever about that and, and the specialization on, on uh, biodata that we have, but uh, the Tenzo, you would be more appropriate to, to take that. So please go ahead. Okay, I seem to have lost Vincenzo. So uh, apologies for that. Uh, we did have some issues with uh, with his connection. Uh, so let me let me take this um, uh, on um, myself. So there are of course uh, several solutions out there that claim to do um, AutoML and and provide an automated machine learning experience. 
Um, we have done uh, extensive comparisons between ourselves and, and these tools. Uh, and the bottom line is that um, this is the only tool that has been designed from the design from the get go uh, to address um, biodata. And this allows us to uh, do some things that the other tools cannot do. Uh, and I mentioned some of those in the beginning. I'll be happy to reiterate those here. Uh, first of all, is the fact that we can work with data that uh, has um, a lot of features. Uh, and uh, this is something, uh, again, competition cannot do. Uh, we can also uh, work and apply the appropriate weights uh, in order to avoid overfitting when we're working with very few samples. Uh, and uh, the third one I would add is the fact that uh, we can uh, also perform analyses that the other tools cannot, which uh, mainly refers to survival analysis. Um, that is something uh, that, the other this. Tools, uh, that the other tools can do. Uh, no worries, Vincenzo, I went ahead and, and responded to that question, but um, I hope that uh, that provides a, um, you know, a, a, a pretty good uh, response. So let me move us to the next question, uh, which is, how can you input the different sprout suppressant use and their influence in the color evolution. Um, so, Vincenzo, I will, I will definitely pass this on to you. So, to my understanding, this will become basically a additional columns, additional column or few more columns inside the dataset. And basically, if we want to predict this, uh, this outcome related to the color, then the relationship should be found if a uh, by the machine learning algorithms that are implementing the platform. This is at least how I interpret the question. I hope it's uh, correct. Yeah, uh, please please feel free to to uh, provide any follow-on questions that you might have if we haven't fully answered your question. Um, there is a, a related one. What are the predictors for black spot bruising and chip quality? Um, and maybe you you would uh, want to turn back to the tool to to show some of the. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, we um, okay. I don't remember them by heart, but uh, a couple of things actually. Uh, we are going to provide the links for you to actually peruse these results by yourself, so you can actually see them one by one, and you can see them. Uh, uh, Oh, on the top of, over the top of my head, I remember that uh, cultivar is uh, the most important predictor if you want to do, uh, restrict yourself on these 20 cultivars. And instead, if you don't want to restrict these 20 cultivars, but you want to have a cultivar agnostic model, then uh, many more metabolites around 20, 25 are needed in order to provide a complete explanation. Yeah, I, I see. I see a recurring pattern here of questions. Um, I, I will take the next one. By the way, uh, if you will direct your attention to the chat, um, uh, our team has also shared these results that uh, Vincenzo mentioned, uh, both on chip coloration and black spot bruising. Um, there is uh, another question um, about what about soil data collected. Uh, is possible to predict the kind of information, this kind of information. I mean, it's related to nutrient content in soils, for example, um, MGL content of samples taken in orchard. Um, I, I have a response, but I'm, I'm sure yours will be more, um, more complete. So uh, I can try to give my response and then you can give yours. I'm, I'm not sure the mine will be more complete. So to my understanding, uh, what, this, what the researchers that actually collected this data, because again, we didn't collect this data. We, the, our work is not about collecting data. Our work is about uh, analyzing the data. But what they did was basically to condense all the information about the soil in just two categories, loamy and uh, sandy. This, of course, it's very restrictive. And if any of you will use that bio uh, and, they want, and you want actually to input more information about the soil, so the concentration of uh, nitrate of other type of nutrients, you can, of course, do it. It's just one more predictor, uh, candidate predictor that you include in the table. 
Aris, I don't know if you want to add that. Yeah, I, that, 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 is, that is exactly what I also wanted to say. There is no limit to how deep you can uh, take your analysis. As we said, we can work on millions of features. So uh, the, uh, the granularity with which you want to address any of these points um, is, is helpful, actually, because it allows us to pinpoint with, with greater, uh, let's say, um, uh, preciseness uh, what it is that makes the difference. Um, so, for example, uh, the Chen's already showed you the difference between you know, naming it as a cultivar or instead looking for all the elements within the cultivar that it can actually be the predictors. So by the same token, you can do that with all the elements um, that you consider uh, during um, your, your pipeline. Um, so uh, I think that we've addressed all the questions. So uh, let me uh, go back to uh, sharing my screen here. Um, and uh, moving us to present mode, and hopefully you can uh, you can see my screen. Yes, uh, it's taking a while to load, so this is where we left it. So I wanted to point out uh, something I believe already the team has shared on the chat uh, that there are uh, there is an endless array of case studies that we can uh, do with. Uh, Jad Bio, and we will be happy to work with yours. Um, you can Sorry, visit Alice, our we, website. We just see the, the slide about the quality the potato. I don't know if you're showing this one. Uh, no, I'm showing the the one with the case studies. You're not seeing it? Uh, not me, at least. Okay, my apologies for that. Let's try it again. All right, let me go ahead and do it again. No, I want to share this one. Okay, now can you see the right slide? Yes. Okay, let's go to present mode then. And hopefully you can still see the right slide. Excellent, thank you, Vicenzo. So as I said, a number of uh, case studies that uh, you can um, visit on our website. But actually, what you can do is uh, also follow this link uh, to sign up to JetBio and have the opportunity to actually work with that same database uh, that we have um, already uh, uploaded on, uh, on the tool for you. There is a section with um, public data sets uh, that you can play with uh, and do your own analysis and actually uh, get a feel for how the tool works uh, yourself. Um, last but not least, since we've already taken care of Q&A, let me just say that uh, we have all these nice social media that you can follow us on. Uh, we do like to produce content uh, and I would uh, be remiss if I didn't mention Potato News today again. Um, there is a wealth of information in there um, if, um, if you're interested in potatoes, and I hope you are uh, since you're here. So uh, please uh, make it a, a habit to, to uh, join them as well and, and peruse the wonderful content in there. Uh, with that, um, let me uh, thank you again for, for joining us. And uh, I hope this was uh, enjoyable and informative. And uh, please uh, feel free to, um, uh, to uh, reach out to us at social at JetBio. Um, we are uh, present in a number of places in the world. So we will be happy to talk to you and answer specific questions uh, or even uh, work with your data um, to produce similar results. So again, thank you all for, for your attendance and uh, stay safe and uh, hopefully enjoy the rest of the week and the weekend.